Right, we'll get started and people will... Um, um... I will send the link. Yeah, brilliant. Guys, what I'll do, I'll just get started and people will join us as we go on. But uh, welcome and uh, to everybody and just to kind of kick things off. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the programmes, this programme is titled New Politics and Afrofuturism, um, which this lecture and goes into. So it's the entire um, part of the programme is, I guess, New Politics and Afrofuturism is calling for black radical imagination and pop culture as a powerful vehicle for propelling progressive social justice narratives to mainstream audiences. And I guess with a specific focus on Afrofuturism, black activism, climate justice, along with some political theory and practice. Familiar with the University of the Underground. It is a free, pluralistic, and transnational university based in the basement of nightclubs with its headquarters in Amsterdam. But due to the recent global events, this program is online. And the title of this lecture and is called um, Kevin Fodderingham's and on his practice, arts and social change, setting up NGOs and independent platforms to support communities in Trinidad and Tobago. And it really gives me the greatest um, pleasure to introduce our wonderful teacher, educator, speaker, you name it. He's currently in uh, Trinidad and Tobago and joining us from there. His name is Kevin Fodderingham and he's an arts and social change advocate, founder of Caribbean Fashion and Arts Feature Festival and East Yard, designer of the Green Violet line of men's accessories and a personal brand visioning coach. He's also an avid supporter of local culture and all things youth. Mr. Fodderingham has been involved with and led several projects in Trinidad that have um, provided a platform for young and emerging talents. In 2016, Fodderingham founded and currently served as executive director of Caribbean Fashions Arts and Feature Festival, uh, which is a nonprofit arts education and promotion organization incorporated with the mission to utilize the arts to directly address social issues affecting young people and retirees primarily in Arima and East Trinidad. Most recently, Fodderingham was elected to the executive uh, of the Amira Community Council. And there's so much more to him, which I'm sure um, he'll um, go into. But um, honestly, Kevon, thank you so much for joining us. We're really, truly honored uh, to have you and join us today. So I will give the floor to you, my friend. Wow, Majid, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, what else can I say? Um, I'm just really honored to be here. And I took a read of some of the bios of the people who are taking part in this program. And I'm like, what am I going to tell them? Because they're all so fantastic in their own right. Um, so as uh, Majid said, I am Kevon Fodderingham. I am an arts for social change advocate, the founder of CFAF, so Caribbean Fashion and Arts Future Festival, in short, the founder of East Yard. And I am a part-time jewelry designer, so I sort of flirt with that. But my focus is really on using the arts to affect social change. I am from Trinidad and Tobago, the land of the steel pan, Calypso, Limbo Dancing, Carnival, and also known as the land of the hummingbird. Um, so that really informs a lot of the way that I navigate the world, being somebody from a Caribbean space. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit about Caribbean Fashion and Arts Feature Festival and how that led to the setting up of East Yard and also what my process is in how I go about planning projects and how I go about executing projects. So I have developed a pretty succinct model that I use because um, it all comes from me. So if I am leading a project, it sort of serves my needs and then it serves the community's needs. So it builds on my skills, it pulls from my talents and my strengths, and then I use that to serve the community as a whole. So what I'm going to do, I am going to share this presentation with you. Can everybody see it? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so it's called Making Space for You. 
and for everyone. So I put the you in caps because at the end of the day, you are the one who is developing all of these projects and ideas and interventions. So you must not take you out of it because I think you know it all comes from you. And once you build that space for yourself, then you are able to invite everyone else in. Yeah? So this is where it started. It began with CFAP. So Caribbean Fashion Arts Feature Festival is a nonprofit organization. We started as an international fashion film and arts festival, um, being the first one in the English-speaking Caribbean. So basically, um, I was involved in a partnership called Akimbo, and it was a fashion boutique, but our focus was on really making it a community-based fashion boutique. So it's in my hometown of Arima, and we became a sort of hub Im immediately because Arima in itself is not the capital of our country. So we're always left behind in terms of whatever creative stuff is happening, all that happens in the capital. So our space quickly became a go-to. So the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival came to us to partner one year during their festival. And they showcased a fashion film in our fashion space. So it got us to thinking, wow, so there's this thing called fashion film. We did some research and we realized that there were numerous festivals across the world that paid homage to the genre of fashion film. So we decided to launch a Caribbean-based version of that. Um, and in the first year, we were, you know, honored enough to be able to be featured in Vogue Italia right out of the box. Um, and that really made us see that we were going in the right direction in terms of community-based action, but also merging fashion and arts. So I'll play this short video. It's a roundup of the first festival. So you can see what it was like.
Right. So that fantastic festival happened in 2016 for the first time. And as you can see, yes, we had a strong focus on film, a strong focus on fashion, a strong focus on the art. But as you would have seen, there was a really strong community-based effort. So we involved the local secondary schools. We ran a competition for them. And they all created their pieces of work that focused on either film or fashion. Um, and we really infused a social element through it. So throughout the three-day festival, we had different workshops and different pop-ups that focused on different areas of social change. So from the get-go, there was that linkage between the arts and social change. So CFAP happened, the first festival happened. And then in 2017, um, by that time, we were like, okay, I think for this work to even have more impact and to even be more community grounded, we need to find a home. Yeah? So it comes back again to you have to serve your needs first before you are able to welcome the community in to serve their needs. So we needed a home. So the festival was growing. Our work was growing. We needed to find a spot, um, East Yard. So one day, literally, um, I was in a taxi. And I, for some reason, I had, a, I had a newspaper, a physical newspaper. I bought one, which I hadn't bought in years, basically, and was scrolling through the classified section. I said, okay, let me see what's, what is there. What is, you know, that's just on a whim. And I saw that there was this space for rent. Um, it was in my hometown. Um, I said, okay, so I'm going to take a look at this space because, I mean, the price looks really good. Um, I didn't even know where the street was, even though I was born and raised in this spot. You don't really know the names of the streets. You just know the landmarks. Went there, um, two-story building in the heart of the, heart of the town, um, but it was underutilized and underoccupied. So there were eight tenant units, but only one or two of them were occupied at the time. And the entire backyard space was literally, as we say in Trinidad, bush. So grass, so the grass was probably as tall as me. Um, but something about that space told me that this is where we needed to be. And I had the name ECR in my mind for a really long time. Uh, I didn't know what it was going to become, but I had that name there. So why East Yard? So Arima, which you'll hear me talk about a lot, which is my hometown, is the eastern borough of our country. So the Royal Chartered Borough of Arima is rich in history. Um, it was at one point in time, it was a, it was a home for the arts. So I'm trying, so I tried to bring that back. And I saw creating a physical space with East Yard as part of that, as part and parcel of that. So we jumped now to creative placemaking. So I had to use these already established and proven methods to build out this space. So we say that creative placemaking is when artists, arts organizations, and community development practitioners deliberately integrate arts and culture into community revitalization work, placing arts at the table with land use, transportation, economic development, education, housing, infrastructure, and public strategies. Creative placemaking champions artistic projects made in public settings rather than funding artists to create masterworks in isolation. So our ECR project was a little different because it's not a public space per se. So it's a private space that we built out to invite the public. So it started off as private, but it has become a public space because it was built for their use. Yeah. Um, and I think what was a blessing for us is that the owner of the property at East Yard, she is also involved in the arts. Um, and she has become a benefactor. She has become a champion. So we partner on a lot of projects. So it makes us existing in her space because she owns the property. It makes our work really meaningful one, but also there's a lot of synergies. Yeah, so you always try to look for those synergies. <clears throat> East Yard. So 
like the tenets of creative placemaking would have said, there are all these elements that you have to put into projects that are placemaking projects. So East Yard, we run programs that are focused on community-based art education. Many times we partner these community-based art education projects with a social cause. So for the last two years, we have been running a youth arts enrichment program where these young people age eight to 18 come in and they get a crash course in visual arts. But paired with that, we also have a, we have a facilitator who comes in and works with them in gender-based violence prevention. And at the end of this exchange, the end of the education project, they have to create a piece of art or create an exhibition that speaks to ending violence against women and girls. So that is where our core is in terms of education. Again, another part of placemaking is the economic empowerment of your space, of your project. Um, we have a boutique out of East Yard. So the boutique at East Yard was at one point in time run by community-based artists and artisans and fashion designers. Um, now we have taken over the running of it, but from the sense of all of these artisans have their stuff stocked in our space and we manage it for them, we market it for them. So we have become an intermediary now. East Yard is available for space rental from workshops to parties to art exhibitions, name it, whatever creative event it is, it's there. So the community now has a space. Um, what's interesting is that Arima, one of the boroughs of Trinidad and Tobago, one of the four bigger towns or cities, did not have a community center for several years. Um, the new community center is opening literally in the next week. So we have been filling that void for the past three years because we started this year in 2017. Um, on site, we have an Airbnb. Um, obviously, it's not active right now because of COVID. But um, when that Airbnb is not being used as an Airbnb, we run our artist in residency program out of there. So it's fantastic to see that when I saw one of the persons log in to this session today is Alana Morris Van Tassel, and I'm singling her out. Um, she was our first artist in residence. And that was before we even had thought of the Airbnb space or thought of having the artist stay on site. Um, and it was an amazing experience. She worked with Jamie Filbert, who is a fantastic choreographer, and together they are still creating wonderful pieces of work. Um, and yeah, so that is what East Yard is centered around. So there's this short video here that can give you a little bit more info on East Yard. Also interested in working with other communities 
activities. Are you wearing a hat? And I'm going to be here and I'm going to be here. Right, so that was East Yard. Um, I'm going to share this here, City of Asylum. So I wanted to show two different types of spaces with two different missions, but who are using the theory of placemaking to inform their work, and that's what their mission is based on. So City of Asylum is one of my favorite nonprofit projects, um, and is based in the USA. So I think they are just doing amazing work. Their focus is on um, writers who are asylum seekers in the States, and they have built a community literally around that idea. So hear a little bit about them. Asylum began in 2004 to provide sanctuary to writers exiled under threat of persecution. Writers in exile come from countries ranging from China, El Salvador, Burma, Venezuela, and we've had visiting writers now from 42 different countries. Kevin, a home so can I say that I can't actually hear the sound? Also made a better home for our own community. So now we offer a full range of literary programs. When you think of the word sanctuary, you think of a closed place, a shelter. But in our case, in the north side of Pittsburgh, the community is actually the sanctuary for our writers. We gathered neighbors from the community to guarantee that the program could exist because we're a grassroots program, unlike any other program in the world. We felt it was really important to be a grassroots organization. on Samsonia Way on the north side has some text on it. The first house that we developed was the house of Wang Zhan, our poet from China, and he wrote an anthology of his poems on the face of the house. Because of our events are so proliferated, we're now in the process of developing a literary center that is called Alphabet City, and we'll have a bookstore, a reading space, a performance space, a space for a workshop, free book distribution, Many people have asked us, and we've thought a lot about why is Pittsburgh such a welcoming place and a place where things can happen. And I think it's because people here have a can-do attitude. We can make a difference, and you don't see that in a lot of places. Yes, yeah, so I think City of Asylum is awesome. Um, so now, okay, we spoke about CFAF, we spoke about East Yard, so we are looking at projects, we are looking at place making, we are looking at social change, we are looking at community engagement, but where do you start? Yeah, and it comes back again, it starts with you. So place making and overall change making projects are varied in nature, but all start the same way with you. So I... I'm pulling from my personal brand coaching now, which I build into the work that I do. <laughs> How do you choose a focal area and approach? We are all interested in so many things and we want to make change on so many levels, but it works a lot better when it's more targeted because it means that you can get whatever it is started. Social change programs are human centered, but are also human driven. Your project should be an extension of you. So the human driven part is you. 
how I go about it is first to identify your three P's. Yeah? Your first P is your proclivity. What are you predisposed to doing? What is something you do regularly? And if you do it regularly, it becomes a skill. So we are looking at here, what do you think your skill or greatest skill set are? Secondly, your passion. What would you do even if there was no monetary reward? And the last P, your purpose. Why do you think you are here? So these three Ps are very important to me um, because every project that I roll out, every program that I start, every thing that I do is informed by these three Ps or serves my three Ps. Why? Because if I follow these three Ps, I know that it is going to be executed well because it's pulling on everything that I am good at, what I am passionate about, and why I believe my purpose. What, what is my purpose? So for me, all projects that I do will focus on some sort of teaching and learning element. Um, by nature, I always find myself teaching. I have taught formally. I have taught informally. I coach. Teaching is my thing. Um, it is the thing that I really think that I may be really good at, maybe the best at, other than my other skills. My passion has always been the arts. So whether it is film, fashion, movies, whatever it is, I'm passionate about the arts and I've always been a supporter of the arts. And my purpose, my purpose, I think, is connecting people. I have always been able to put somebody onto somebody else or build that network or see connections that may not have been easily seen. So everything that I do, all my projects have an element of teaching and learning, have an element of the arts, and have an element of connecting people. Yeah? So you have that. You have your three Ps. So after your three Ps, now you kind of know what it is you want to do. But then how do you roll out? So I also developed something for rolling out. They call the three C's. So we have the three P's and the three C's. So the three C's, these are project rollout steps that I use for all projects. Um, they must have these elements, I think. The first element being cultivation. The second element being co-creation. And the third element being connection. Let's talk about the three C's. Cultivation. So fostering an environment for holistic learning and development. So whether your project is a creative placemaking project or it's a social change project in the broadest sense, um, I believe there should be an element of cultivation. So your priority population, you must leave them in a better space than they were at before you engage them, before you engage with them. So what do they need to better themselves, whether it's education or whether it's skills? So this focuses on capacity building. So your project should have an element of capacity building. Co-creation. Working not just for the community, but with the community. So after you have decided what this project is going to be, then it's to work with the community, to work with the stakeholders, to see how it can better suit their needs. You came up with the idea, yes, um, because you saw a need, but then now you're taking it back to them. So it has to be community driven. It, there has to be that level of ownership. And truly at the end, if you need to step out, they must be able to claim it and keep this thing going. So this co-creation part is finding these stakeholder driven solutions. So this is where you would Think of who are your partners going to be? Who are the community leaders that you're going to engage? Are there government, local government agencies that need to be involved? Are there nonprofit partners who can amplify the work rather than, du than rather than duplicate the work you're doing? So this is where you have to broach that topic. So you had the development aspect of it in terms of the populations, and now you're taking it back to them to co-create the program. 
and the third C is connection. So after you have built this fantastic program, how do you share the knowledge that you would have gained? And sharing the knowledge is not just about putting it on social media and saying this is where you can reach us. Because through the cultivation and the co-creation phase, you would have developed tools. You would have found ways for quick wins. You would have developed theories. You would have found examples for things. How do you share these resources? Um, scaling does not always mean the growth of your organization and size. It could be the growth of your ideology. You're sharing what you would have learned. And that is how your projects and ideas live forever because you would have shared the wins that other people can now use and build upon more. So we have the three Ps that feed into the three Cs. So as you will see, every program that I do serves my three Ps and is rolled out using the three Cs. Right, three Ps plus three Cs equal win. What's next for Caribbean Fashion and Arts Feature Festival? Wow, we have been on a real exciting journey over the past few months. Um, I will go back to last year quickly. So last year in September, um, I was selected by the US Embassy here to take part in the International Visitor Leadership Program, which is the US State Department's premier exchange program opportunity. So it took myself and 17 other arts for social change leaders from around the world um, to Washington DC. We started there. Then our, group, our groups broke up into four teams. So my team went to Louisville, Kentucky. Um, the others went to Akron, Pittsburgh, and somewhere else. We came back together in Los Angeles, and then we all went to Miami. So we spent 21 days traveling. And over that 21 days, we had the honor and experience of a lifetime, meeting dozens and dozens and dozens of American arts for social change leaders and activists and change makers and we were able to learn from their programs but also to share what each of us was doing in our own countries remember you had 18 people from 17 different countries because there were two people from the same country um and just that experience of exchange that cross-cultural exchange and cross-cultural collaboration i think was a life-changing experience for me personally and i believe for everybody else who was on the program so literally, when I got back home, um, I had a sit down with myself and decided that all of this knowledge that I would have gained abroad, I mean, would not have happened without that cultural exchange. So even what is happening right here in this program that you all are doing now, we are doing cultural exchange. And I think that's so much richness and so much information and so much connectivity comes out of that. So we decided um, to realign and to streamline the work that we would have already been doing in using arts for social change and now adding that element of cultural, of cross-cultural exchange to it. And we launched a program called For Common Good. So we believe that art is a universal language and through it, each nation makes its own unique contribution to the culture of mankind. So it captures the power of art, but also the power of cultural exchange. So for Common Good is this platform that we are building that is going to focus on promoting arts and social change, but also building a physical as well as a virtual platform to connect arts and social change activists, workers, change makers around the world. Coming out of my trip, as part of the IVIP program, I made connections with the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana and conceptualized an exchange that would happen between my hometown of Arima and Louisville, Kentucky. So the main goal of this project is to provide a social change network and platform focusing on the use of the arts and culture to foster long-term self-sustained relationships 
and institutional linkages among organizations in the United States and in Trinidad and Tobago. So what this program is going to do, we are taking 60 change makers, 60 Trinidadian based change makers who are doing brilliant work in the arts as a whole, who are educators at both the secondary and primary and tertiary school levels, who are involved in local government planning, who are authors. So, so it's really a whole gamut of creatives. And we are giving them the opportunity to take part in three distinct cultural exchange opportunities with Louisville-based experts. So the first opportunity is going to focus on writing for culture. So we are going, our change makers are going to be exposed to oral history documentation, community-based journalism, capturing these stories of people who have stories to tell. So these unheard persons, these community-based historians who have all of this history about their community. So we're going to capture all of that, and that's going to be developed into a book. So it's ARIMA-based. Um, second one is using the arts to work with people with special needs. So in our Trinidadian context, yes, we have institutions and schools that work with people with special needs, but I don't think that they have as much of the capacity support that they need. They don't have as much of the tools that they need. So when I went to Louisville, there was this fantastic program by the Zoom group that has been going on for several years. So it's a day center where Louisvillians, our people with special needs, they visit each day and their focus is visual arts and they are engaged, people with um, cerebral cerebral palsy with learning difficulties, with the whole gamut of difficulties. And they are creating the most beautiful works of art and telling their own stories and they are so engaged. So much so that local banks and institutions have been commissioning work from these artists. It was a really beautiful thing to see. And the final exchange focuses on community arts engagement using public arts. So our change makers are going to see and learn from some Louisville-based projects that have really have a gold star stamped on them for engaging the community through public arts. All of this is being funded by the American Embassy here in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's that one exchange. And again, it's based on the three Cs. So we have our co-creation part of it, which is the capacity building sorry, the cultivation part, we have the co-creation part because we are working with communities. And finally, there's that connectivity where we are going to build this online platform now to house all of this learning and knowledge to share with everyone. We have a youth version to this called the Youth Art Enrichment Program where 100 um, high school aged Trinidadian students are going to get the opportunity to have this learning exchange with people from Burundi, South Africa, Myanmar, Philippines, the UK, and the US. And they are going to get a real intense masterclass type training on different aspects of the arts, dance, theater, music, and visual arts. And then they are going to come up with a community-based engagement that focuses on what they would have learned. Yeah. So with three C's there again. Cultivation, we're increasing the knowledge of these young persons as well as the older ones who are in the area exchange. The co-creation, social impact proficiency. So everything that we do ends in a community-based activity or initiative that is really guided by the community. And connection, again, I spoke about this platform that we're going to build. And under, again, you see each of them serve my four Ps, which are there must be a training element, there must be a community-based initiative around it, and there must be something in place to share everything that would have been learned or done. And this final video, just me chatting about for common good, and then we open it up for some questions. My name is Kevin Fondergham. Quick thing, Kevin. Kevin, yeah. Hi, yeah. The, the volume is a bit low on the video. On this one? Yeah, and I think the other ones, it's just a bit, yeah, the video is just a bit low. 
that's fine um what well if i well i'm going to share it with them they can they can then take a look after okay and brilliant no problem they, thank you yeah. very much you're welcome so yeah and that's i say thank you as well no and um, a massive thank you to uh, to you kevin really really and appreciate it and i'm going to say afterwards if at all possible if, if you can share the links to the videos uh, and yeah. that would be amazing and, and i'll share it with everybody else so we can kind of watch that video thank you very much very and uh, insightful and just to kick off has anyone got any specific questions at all feel free to take yourself off mute yeah i have a question kevin mm -hmm. um for your presentation i'm my name is Lee. My question is, how do you um, you take that first step to recruit and engage with community members? You know, okay. Hard enough for me to like get people into a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, like um, for for me personally, um, I am better with doing this with this kind of thing in terms of you know coming up with the ideas and all of that but i really depend on other members of my team who who their skill is in community engagement so you really look for these community leaders and they and they are there there are some people who are so ingrained in the different um, communities that they exist in that everybody sort of turns to them so they are always a representative. They are the ones who are able to pull the uh, community together. So use them as an intermediary. Find these champions who are already doing work and then you then collaborate with them. So it's not about me going into a brand new place and saying, this is what I'm coming to do. No, I'm seeing what is already existing, who is already doing the work and seeing how I can amplify their work by joining with them. Make sense? Brilliant, thank you. And um, Ben, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah. I was because I caught them. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, it might be a bit of a large question, but yeah. sort of in creating these sort of like co-constructed collaborative models. So, I, and I'm going to ask you in terms of where you're at now, because I know. Mm -hmm. So, what what's been your, I guess, your biggest challenge, and your biggest learning? <laughs> <laughs> biggest challenge um it's not a okay yes it is a challenge but all challenges are opportunities for innovation money 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 obviously right <laughs> um so the first edition of cfa literally i took a gamble so i worked in public health just before i started cfa so i had a high paying global public health job and as with these things funding came to an end. So after six years of a high paying job where I traveled and all of that severed, but then I got a severance. So I gambled on my severance to launch this thing. Yeah. Um, and it paid off afterwards. So it's taking that chance on yourself as well, which is a challenge. But none of these projects that I have done, even though they have had impact, have had like large pots of funding. Mm -hmm. It's been pretty small and it, you know, it makes me rely on partnerships even more. So I think the partnerships are important. Um, another challenge is that in this nonprofit space, as all of us would know, we are all competing for the attention of funders. And at times it's the same funders. We are competing for the attention of the same communities. We are competing for the attention of the media. So. Um, instead of operating in silos, what I am really, really, really trying to do is to see how I can come in and not position myself as a threat, but more as a collaborator. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing something that is being done really well, I am not going to do it. I'm going to ask you to come and do this with me. Come and bring your talent and I bring mine and let's amplify the thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, so that is a really big challenge in terms of one, the funding, but also the competent interest. Yes. Yeah. Did I did I answer the question? Most definitely. Okay. Cool. You're welcome. Brilliant. And um, anybody got any other questions at all? 
Mm. What are you working on at the moment, um, Kevin? Is there anything specifically exciting that you are currently excited about working on that you can share with us? This um this um for this for, this for common good platform that we are building um that's really really exciting because it's giving me the opportunity to connect our local creators to the world at large. So it's really about exchange right now. Um, and I think the feedback has been pretty good. We like literally launched a week ago. So last week we launched and we already have, so we were looking for 60 creatives to be part of the exchange. I think we have 40 or already registered. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and we were going to travel to Louisville, but obviously COVID. So we had to take that out of the project. But I am right now looking for international partners who are willing to work with me on developing these artistic creative exchanges between our people and theirs. So I'm putting that into this group right here, right now. Yeah, fantastic. And I guess, yeah, you kind of briefly touched upon it. I was just curious to know in terms of how the current climate and everything moving online, how that's really impact. I guess what the positives and the negatives of it have been for you? Um, the positives of online for me has been more to develop my uh, personal brand. So because I had the time over the past how many months we were inside, I was able to launch my own podcast. I was able to position myself more as a speaker on after social change. And now I ended up here. And I've been asked to speak at so many different forums. So I think the whole notion of the being on lockdown and this new digital rev this revolution is really good for positioning yourself um, as not necessarily an authority, but somebody who knows about what it is they're doing. And it's about sharing. And I think no other time in our history has it been so easy to share and have people been so ready to engage. So I think we need to roll with that. So I see the, you know, yes, we're in a pandemic. Um, I actually lost two of, two, of, two of my cousins in the States to the um, pandemic, um, young person. So, you know, there is that sadness. But again, it's now for us to take all of this negativity and sadness and hurt and turn it into something good. No, 100%. First of all, like, and sorry to hear about your loss. And I definitely Thank appreciate you. understand that. Same time, it does provide an, a lot of opportunities and especially the whole collaborative thing because I guess there's only so much that we can do, especially when those resources are limited because yeah. we can't do what we've always been doing. Collaborating, you know, I've, been, I've been seeing it. Whether that be in the, like, even in the business sector, the private, like private sector, the charity sector, or a lot of people have basically been coming together and working collaboratively, especially when there's not much money or funds and stuff to kind of uh, go around. But just again, just wanted to and uh, say a massive and uh, thank you, and uh, for joining us and sharing your wisdom and uh, with us, Kevin. And please, definitely do if you could email me the links to videos. I will, yeah, where, yeah. Where can people find you? Like, what's your social media and handle okay. websites? All right, so you can find me at www.kevonfodderingham.com, and my Instagram is the same. It's at uh, Kevin Fodderingham, and then from there you can find all of the different um, projects I'm on. Brilliant. Thank you once again, Kevin. Have Thank you for having day. me. No, the pleasure and love is all ours. Really, really appreciate your time and sharing the news. You. So thank you very much. And thanks for everybody for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.